Welcome to the How to Find and Keep a Gay Man podcast. I'm Matt Bays, your host, with Matt Heinker, your co-host. And we're here to provide bitchy wisdom for the gay man looking for love. There are a lot of gay men out there looking for a meaningful love experience, and we are here to help. You can follow How to Find and Keep a Gay Man on Instagram and TikTok, where you'll find all sorts of bitchy wisdom about what it's going to take to find and keep a gay man. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Welcome to How to Find and Keep a Gay Man. Bitchy Ooh, wisdom yeah. for the gay man looking for love. Matt, are you looking for love? Oh, I found love, honey. Caller, so are you looking for love? <laughs> I always wanted to have Delilah's job. I thought that'd be so fun. I know. You know? Yeah. Oh, I'm married to a truck driver. I don't think he loves me no more. What do you think, Delilah? <laughs> well, I think you're a beautiful creature. Where are She's like, and this song is for you. Tonight, <laughs> I celebrate <laughs> Exactly. I tell you what, I just ate me up some Delilah back in the day. Delilah. And for us, it was on Light Rock 106 and a half. Yes. And a half. And a half. They worked that into that jingle. Delilah herself was very unlucky in love. Married five times. Shut up. She said that gave her the tender spot in her heart for other people's stories of love and loss. Yes. And a lot of people would say that somebody that's been married five times knows nothing about love. When in fact, they might know more than any of us do Mm -hmm. about love. If they've been open, maybe it took them five times. You know, five times a charm. Lord, that sounds like a lot of pain. It sounds expensive to me, Morning. I ain't going to be no judgy bitch. Well, that's not true. I'm going to be a judgy bitch, but not with (laughs) Delilah. Because I like her. Not with Delilah. How was your week, darling? My week was awful because I have COVID, even as we speak. You sound exponentially better today even than you did yesterday. So I'm glad you're feeling a little better. Yeah. Today, I feel like, honestly, that I'm at about 70%, which is great. Because I had a couple days where I felt like I'd been run over by a bus. Oof. Not great. Here we are in 2023 still getting COVID. Lord, deliver us, please. Why is this still a thing? Yeah. So sad. Well, and remember on the last episode, I talked about how Chris had gone out of town. So oh, excited. Yeah. The hubs came home last night, yada, yada. Well, <laughs> he was in Nashville and brought COVID home and got it all over mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Listen, I got COVID from my head to my toes. <laughs> you got COVID and I've been in a cleanse. So we've both been in different versions of hell. Yes. Trying to get snatched for this wedding. And uh, I tell you what, oh, what are we looking to do over here? Because last week, so this is accountability time, because last week you talked to us about perfectionism and body image. So tell oh, us. Oh, Lord, yes. Oh, it's a come to Jesus moment. Kick me where it's tender. <laughs> yes. No, you're not wrong. So this is the deal. Like, I really want to have a better relationship with myself and love myself. That's very true. But it's a journey you know, for everyone. Yeah. And I, uh, when I met Ty, I was at a place of kind of peace and rest of where I was physically and in shape wise. When you were going to CrossFit three times a day. No, <laughs> no when I was on, uh, you know, when I was just doing my thing and then I turned 40 and, um, you know, uh, I got a little thicker and I'm just trying to snatch it down just a little bit for the pictures for the wedding with the understanding that we all get older and you got to do your best and forget the rest, as Tony says. And so I'm trying to find that balance still here as we speak. I, I get that it's it's not a clear path, but yeah, want to look yeah. good for your wedding. That's every, everybody want to look snatched for her wedding. Come on. That's a very baseline human expectation. Of course. Aspiration. Yes. So that's yeah. what I'm doing. Watch but I tell you house. what, if I do this cleanse for 30 days and I only lose seven pounds or none, I'm going to be like, Lord. I did my best. How much are you losing? You know, 10 pounds. Just snatch it up just a little bit. You know, you snatch it up and get the breasts out there. <laughs> get the waist snatched. <laughs> waist snatched. Get my cheekbones bosom. singing to the she sun. Just, pictures, she just you know. wants to have ample bosom for her wedding <laughs> night. I got ample bosom. That's not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
knew this couple and, and they were older. And I just remember sitting at dinner and her saying, oh, he loves a nice bosom. Did she have an ankle bosom? She did not. I tell you what, if I was a woman, I would buy myself custom titties exactly that I wanted and just be done with it. You Why would. not? Oh, for sure. You doesn't look like Dolly Parton. Just get your, you know, you want a B plus, a D minus titty, you know, get, psh, buy them things custom and go on your way and have a good time. I, I know. Well, I have to talk about that sometime because I haven't crossed the Botox path yet, but it has run through my head before. But I, I don't think that I will do it because I think I'm married to somebody who would never. And so I don't think I will either. Yeah. You know, that's kind of beautiful. It's so funny you say we'll that. We'll see one day. I'm not above it. You already know. <laughs> I've considered just doing a light round of it for the again for the wedding. And Damn, Tyler, you're doing this with your fingers. Tyler, for, Tyler forbids it. He's like, that is absolutely ridiculous. You're gorgeous. You're 41. Wait, did you say a light round for the wedding? Yes. Honey, you want to be able to cry. I mean, I just, I'm actually very concerned that I'm going to blubber like a complete idiot the entire time. Put some hankies in your pocket, honey. I might need, you'll be up there with me. And you want, might need one. Oh, Matt, I have to tell you. Please. I woke up early this morning and saw the movie called Spoiler Alert. Loved that movie. What did you I found it? it to be incredibly meaningful. Gay movie. Okay. About Michael. Oh, that's the new one from the guy. Osceola. Jim Parsons, the guy in Big Bang Theory. You know what? Michael gonna... Asielo. He's a screenwriter. And his relationship with a man who dies of cancer, and that's not a spoiler alert. Uh, because they show that from scene one. Oh, so it's cancer, not AIDS. No, it's cancer. Okay, because you know what? I read the synopsis and I was like, I do not need to watch another depressing movie where his lover dies of AIDS. Can we have a triumphant oh. story? We were literally going to go see it. And I read the synopsis and I was like, I can't watch a gay couple dying of AIDS. I can't do it. Nope. That's not what it is. Okay. No, go watch that movie. Okay. I felt like for the first 35, 45 minutes that I was watching me and Chris. <gasps> I really did. It was okay. so humorous and cute and light and fun. I didn't know the turn that it was going to take, but it flirts with the line of saccharine sweet, but avoids it. So it's very real. And I thought it was a beautiful movie. I loved that it wasn't about shame-filled messages for the LGBT community. Showing you a normal know, couple doing normal things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love yeah. It. Wow. Yeah. Well, check it out. Story. Oh, it's I so just good. feel like all the queer movies, even if they're bad, we have to we have to watch them. We have to give them the the traction, the dollars, everything. So we get more of them. I can't yes. believe how many meaningful LGBTQ plus roles there have been the last couple of years. It's it's a new day. It's getting it's been better. Fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys got some homework to do this weekend. I'm on it, honey. We're watching. You're gonna be like this the first half. <laughs> And then the second half, you're going to be like, <laughs> oh, Lord, oh, no. I'm going to scrape Ty up off the floor. He didn't do well with that kind of thing. OK, so we are going to talk today about some fun stuff. So are thou ready to receive? Ooh. Art thou ready to receive? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we oh. talked last week. Uh, well, we've talked in several episodes about being ready. You know, that, it, that it's not just about finding the person, but it is also about being ready to receive that person into your life mm -hmm. to have that experience and, and what it requires of us romantically, spiritually, emotionally, uh, relationally in all aspects. Sure. So I want to talk about that because you mentioned last time the inner saboteur. The inner saboteur. Yes which I think exists in probably 95% of gay men. I'd say 99 and a half, but yes. There's a funny thing about that, Matt, because I think that it is in a lot of gay men. I think it's in a lot of men, period. But I notice a difference with my Chris than myself. I have an inner saboteur, and I don't think that he actually does. You really think that? I do. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know all that makes it up, but I do know some of the logical conclusions, which are bad relationship with men or male figures. And we yeah. can call it a, a daddy issue. For sure. You know, 
I think a lot of that is what it is for me, plus a complex childhood. I mean, or as a queer person, understanding that you're a second rate citizen and not treated nicely by society at large growing up or even as an adult in some situations. Yeah, yeah I think that's a big part of it as well. And and maybe spending so much of our time thinking about that and trying yeah. to work that out in ourselves that we don't maybe develop some other parts of ourselves. Yeah, I think that's very true. I read a quote this week. One of the most tragic aspects of our oppression as gay men and lesbians has been the fact that we have had to devote so much of our time to social and political action on the most basic level. Our political action, while necessary in many cases, has resulted in a kind of forced extroversion, leaving us little time, patience, and energy for the equally necessary inner work around what it means to be lesbian or gay. I think that's brilliant. And yeah, it's so funny, there's, you know, there's this caricature of a gay person that's like extra loud, showy, whatever. And I think that that is, you know, mostly built out of overcompensation. So we're mm -hmm. trying to be heard, trying to be acknowledged, even if that's, you know, a really outrageous version of, you know, our community or who we, who people perceive us to be. Yeah. We feel like that's necessary. So we're seen and heard. Yeah. And given the same rights. Yeah. And so you either have these extreme introverts, you know, who are just quiet and I'm just going to hide out here, or you do have the bell of the ball, loud. Yeah. Uh, Flipping the fan. <laughs> yes. Yes. The fan, the, you know, and a lot of that stuff is fun, but again. Yeah. But is that really who you are or are you showing out? You always tell people, I've heard you say in relational advice before, like, stop being a caricature of a gay man, be who yeah. you are, because that's who your partner fell in love with. That's who he wants to hang out with, you know? Yes. Yeah, and so I, take I it to a true. dinner party and yeah. circle snap till your heart's content, <laughs> you know, but put that shit away when you go home and be an actual human being. Yeah, Not I, I, told, like, I think that's a good point. Like I, I can like turn it up and be way more queer than I would normally be just at a party just for fun. But I think it's really important for us to show up in the world as queer people. And we're just who we are. We're not in some box, you know, I'm a business person. I'm a father, you know, I'm, I yeah. live in the burbs with everyone else and I just want to have a good life. And I yeah. want the same respect and an yeah. acknowledgement that anyone else does, you yeah. know? And, it, yeah. You know. Interestingly enough, uh, and I'll mention it from time to time, the, we can do hard things podcast, Clennon Doyle and Abby Wambach, but she mentioned uh, just this week about how queer people tend to be so tied to their sexuality uh, yeah. Because they talk about it all the time. They kind of have to talk about it all the time yeah. where heterosexual people never really talk that much about their sexuality because yeah. it's not an issue that constantly has to be brought up and defended or whatever it be. And so I wonder if sometimes this, uh, uh, the way people present themselves is more reactionary. Yeah. I've kind of had to do this to assert myself in order to be accepted. If I go big, maybe you'll back down some and accept sure. me or leave me alone. <laughs> I just started at a new firm a few months ago. And in the interview process, I said, by the way, you know, I'm a, I'm a queer person and, you know, I live in a conservative state, work in a conservative industry. And I felt like before they hired me, I needed to defend why I was still a good hire despite the fact that I'm a queer man, which is sad when you really think about it, but yeah. it's, it's still necessary. And so I have been really determined to be who I am and show up, present myself as I am, let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. Part of what I want to get at in this, uh, in this episode is when we're saying, art thou ready to receive? We are <laughs> talking about how there are good people out there that are that we talked about the inner self saboteur, you yeah. know, that RuPaul talks about and how where that comes from and how it keeps alienating me or isolating me from uh, potential gentleman callers, good people that Absolutely. I come across that I continue to break it off with time and time again. Absolutely. How many chances do we get? You know, that's a good question. It's it's funny. I know you've got a really good example of this. I, Ty and I have a dear friend. It's kind of a funny situation. 
when I was dating, I met this guy and we had a really good time. I don't think we were super strong love connection, but we just really genuinely enjoyed each other's company. Mm -hmm. And so after Ty and I had been together for about a year, I actually reconnected with him and introduced him to Ty and he started to hang out with us. And now he's a pretty good friend of both of ours, ironically. And this guy is the sweetest guy in the world, got a good job, really fun, interesting person. And I systematically have first set him up with all my ex-boyfriends and Ty has also introduced him to a few guys and we'll go on these double dates with these people we introduce them to every few months for the last couple of years. It's like a fun little project, you know, and we will introduce, we've introduced him to a few and he'll be like, oh God, he is a great guy. Like, thank you for the introduction. We're having a great time. And inevitably three or four weeks. How's things going? Oh, he was sweet. We just kind of lost touch or, you know, we didn't, we have, I haven't seen him in two weeks. I, I don't know. It always fizzles out. Even if initially he was very interested and in, the people that we've introduced him to are quality. We've done some pre-work. Oh, I believe right? it. Yeah. And he will connect with them and there'll be, in, there'll be attraction or interest and it inevitably within a month two max fizzles. Yeah. And so his inner saboteur prevents him from receiving or giving, despite who it is, despite how great the candidate is. Yeah. And um, it's honestly, we laugh about it, but it really grieves me because he would love to be in a long-term relationship, but he's not ready to receive. He's definitely not ready to give. Yeah. And so we all have stories like that. And we're going on the assumption here that these are people that want to be and would say that that's what they desire is a long-term committed relationship. Uh, but for whatever reason, they can't seem to make that happen. I yeah. do have a story of a friend from several years ago who has come across good person after good person after good person. Yeah. Uh, he's a good person. Yeah. And it just keeps ending. Now, there are times when that could be that they're just not right for each other. But yeah, as we discussed in Soulmates, the episode on Soulmates, I don't think that there's just one person for us. I do think that there are good people out there that we can connect ourselves to, commit to, choose them as a soulmate and make a life sure. together. With the, the non-negotiables met and chemistry, all of those things. Okay. Yeah. But time and time again, I've watched him walk away from some really good people. And it's given me pause to stop and think, what is the issue? What is yeah. holding you back from making this connection? So that's what I want to unpack a little bit. Yeah, uh, This isn't rocket science, but I sure. do think that there are a few things I'm coming to the table with one in particular that I want to talk about, but I want to hear from you what you think about that too. So one thing that I think is super prevalent um, in our community is uh, this, this idea that we need to be ready for the next best thing. For an example, this show that I'm really enjoying right now, it's called Sex Diaries. And it basically, it's on HBO Max, and it basically chronicles the sex and love life of eight different people over a, a four-part series. And two of the couples are queer. And one of the boys, one of the men, queer men that's on it, says dating in New York City is brutal. It's almost, it verges on a competitive sport. You'll be on a date with someone else mm -hmm. and he will literally be looking over your shoulder as he's talking to you to see if there's a hotter guy at the bar to talk to after your date's over. I mean, that's an extreme example and, you know, the Mecca of gay people in New York City. But I think that gay people, uh, there's this, a lot of us are stuck in this, like, well, is there somebody hotter? Is there someone better? Is there, you know, yes. the next best thing? We're addicted to what that might be for whatever reason. There's an insecurity that propels us towards that. And so it's hard for a lot of people in our community to be satisfied with anybody, even if they're a good match. And I think that that's a really big problem for a lot of us. Yeah. Well, and the answer to, is there a hotter guy is yes, always. Yes. There's always someone hotter. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Always. Yeah. But I, I think that's a really big problem. In same-sex couples are, the documentary says that they're the cohabitating same-sex couples are statistically in the U.S. three times more likely to break up than hetero. So that shows this very quick dissatisfaction with our partners based on whatever. We think that we can do better elsewhere. 
you know, to your point earlier, we don't have really good attachment um, skills that, you know, there's a lot of reasons, mm-hmm. but we're not ready to receive a lot of us. And why is that? You know, it seems that a lot of people in the queer community have not done their work, Matt. Well, yes. some of the people that I've encountered in, in doing <laughs> your work, you begin under, to understand better how to accept life on life's terms. Yeah, that's Absolutely. really important. Mm-hmm. So if I can't do that, then I am just going to find fault in everyone and everything around me. We're a blaming culture. And yeah. so it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault instead of pointing the finger back at myself and figuring out what is it that I need to do here. And sometimes the answer is leave. Yeah. But sometimes the answer is get the fuck over it. <laughs> yes. Build a bridge and get the fuck over it. Build a bridge. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you ever read articles on the Gay Therapy Center. It's online blog, huh. but it's basically, <clears throat> you know, a national psychologist that work with queer people. And it said that couples that are not prepared to acknowledge at the beginning that relationships require care, conversation, consensus, effort at the beginning are most of the time destined to hurt each other. It says that rather than dealing with your own wounds and, and, and healing from those and moving forward, you kind of trigger each other and re-injure each other's wounds over and over again. So the relationships are fragile. They call it attachment wounding. And so if you don't go into the relationship understanding this person's not here to please me, to help me live my best life, to make me feel a certain way, We're here to love and care for each other. We're here to create safe space for each other. We're here to love on each other, be considerate of one another, work on things when they get hard. If you can't enter into a relationship with that posture at the beginning, this attachment wounding we see all over the place. You know, people that haven't done their work, they don't have that posture going into the relationship. So you enter into bad water pretty quickly, you know? Yeah. I haven't gathered the tools. Yeah, which brings us to our cornerstone message. Get a therapist. (laughs) Get a damn therapist. Listen, what we want in this podcast is, you know, neither one of us are licensed therapists. I'm a life coach and you've done Mm -hmm. so much damn work on yourself. Uh, We just know what's worked for us and what we have noticed around people and friends uh, and through our own mistakes and learning what we've done wrong is uh, sort of my heart on trying to help people find a new way and find access. It's, I really hope that as people listen, who wants something, it's trial and error. And it really is going Mm -hmm. to a therapist, telling the truth, opening yourself up and saying, help me get this right in Mm -hmm. here, inside Mm -hmm. myself, my mind, my heart, right so that I can move myself into a a place where I'm open to another person coming into my life and I have things to give Mm -hmm. them and I'm able to receive not just love that's gifts and joy, but also Mm -hmm. critique and accountability and you call it consensus. Yeah. Those are things that require work and they require grown ass men. Yeah. Okay. So I called a friend of mine today, one of my very best friends. He's not gay, but he has a childhood that looks a lot like mine. And I've heard Mm -hmm. him talk about this before. And I want to share something because it was about the inner self-saboteur that I think so many of us gay men deal with. I just said, what does the inner self-saboteur look like to you. Now, this is a guy who is, he's been married for 20 years. Uh, He has four kids. Uh, He's crazy in love with his wife. She's crazy in love with him. He's Mm -hmm. successful. He's built a career and done really, really well. I said, what does the inner self-saboteur look like for you? Mm -hmm. I wrote down everything that he said. He had it at the ready. He said, (laughs) unrealized fear of failure and embarrassment turned inward, sometimes without realizing it. Sometimes without realizing it. Love that. Mm -hmm. You don't even know it's happening. Yeah. So then he says, if I can ruin it before I fail, then I'm in control. (laughs) Think about that in regards to relationships. Absolutely. 
Yeah. If I can ruin it before I fail, then I'm in control. Then I can blame myself, which is self-worth stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Then he said, in essence, you don't feel worthy. So you take that unworthiness and ruin good things before life does or before another person can hurt you. Ooh, you better preach so much. Yeah. Then he said, so I'm going to fall on my own sword before letting someone grab it and stab me. <laughs> that doesn't hurt as bad. And then I said, why is that better? That's what I asked him. And he said, because I'm in control or perceived control that I'm fucked up, which supports the theory that I'm a piece of shit. Oh, wow. Hashtag bad dad. <laughs> daddy. Hashtag daddy. Hashtag issues. daddy issues. <laughs> I mean. Oh. So Matt, when I got married and I've mentioned this before, I was very shocked that it was the first time in my life that I felt unworthy of somebody that I was with. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't figure out what the problem was. Like I kept thinking this is going to end. Somebody's going to die. <laughs> this is all <laughs> too good to be true. So yeah. who has cancer, me <laughs> or him? Like who's dying? Yeah. I just need to know. And You've literally said that to me before. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And so I, I took it to my therapist who I would love to have on the podcast at some point and said, what is this? And we got to the unworthiness thing, the talk of that I just feel unworthy. And mm -hmm. she said, what is your fear surrounding that? And it was just like, I just blurted out. I said, I'm going to fuck this up. Yeah. And you know me, mm -hmm. like, I'm not a bad guy. I'm not no. looking to cheat. I'm not on no. grinder. I'm not like, we have a monogamous relationship. I'm and not you're also guy. sweet as pie to your man. I'm very good to him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, how am I going to fuck this up? I'm, I feel like I'm going to fuck this up. Yeah. And she said, but you're not, you're not going to, but you're not. Yeah. And I don't know what it was about her looking at me. And I've spent a lot of time with her and saying those words to me, but it, it made an impression yeah. And it was more the impression was, this isn't just going to happen. You would have to make decisions that would lead to this conclusion. Sure. Absolutely. You know? So yeah. it's it's not going to happen just by accident. So remove the fear attached to that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And she was also saying, you are just at this place. You've done a lot of work. Yes. You're at this place where you're afraid it's going to be taken because you have this beautiful relationship, but you would have to step out of integrity with yourself completely yeah. in order to botch this thing. And you're, you're not going to do that. And you know what? Today, I believe that I'm not yeah. going to do that. And as we've <laughs> talked about how these issues that we have are things that we have to manage. You know, yeah. they're not things that we can necessarily eradicate, that we can't dig them up all the time by the roots. Sure. This is something that when it crops back up in my life, that I will take to the Lord in you prayer, <laughs> you, <laughs> that I will manage when it. When your inner saboteur says, you're going to fuck this up, you don't deserve this. You say, no, honey, that's not true. And I'll Go say, away. hey, mm -hmm. thank you for the warning. And thank you yes. for looking out for me. Absolutely. But that is a version of me that is no longer me. So you can ride shotgun or in the back seat or in the trunk and you can <laughs> warn me from there, but I'm in charge here and I make good decisions. Yeah. And as Patty LaBelle says, I ain't going to block the blessings. Yes. <laughs> Pick off those shoes. Come on now. <laughs> you know, I love when Patty kicks off the shoes. Oh, I do too. I'm not blocking the blessing. Our listeners get to a therapist. I can't afford it. Yes, you can. Because yeah. I know you ordered DoorDash last week. <laughs> Many times. Yes. You can afford a therapist if it's a priority to you. Um, mm -hmm. And we talked about the slide and scale. There's all kinds of resources. You know, most people, if they have health insurance from an employer, there's at least an EAP program where you can get six or 10 sessions for free. You know, so I mean, there's all kinds of resources if it really is important to you and it has to be. Okay. But I think if you can get to a queer therapist, that alone 
that's going to help you. Yeah. So we've got this, you know, this inner saboteur we have to deal with, feeling that we're worthy, being ready to mm-hmm. give back. We talked about the next best thing syndrome. That's a huge problem. And I think, you know, for me, if I look at this in three buckets, it's those two. And the third for me is really, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. We're not having the relational skills to sustain it. So the relationship needs daily tending. We talked about tending your garden, keeping your soulmate, feeling like a soulmate in that episode. But I feel like when you get into a relationship with somebody that's a good match or that you recognize someone that at least you're even really interested in, you have to be ready to do some work to sustain it. Mm-hmm. Another piece that I read in preparation for this is The Advocate, which is a really well-known LGBT plus magazine nationally. Yeah. And they had this article that said 10 signs that your relationship is over. And I was like, oh, geez. And I looked at it and they were the most vapid. And this is from a reparable queer like news source. It was like, you're not happy. Number one, two, he's not happy. Number three was like, you stop communicating. Um, you start to make plans that don't include him. Uh, the sex slows down or even stops. Number seven was when you get bored. And I'm just like, (laughs) are you serious? Like, this is the advice we're giving our community. This is how shallow we collectively are, how easily we give up in relationship, even with somebody Mm -hmm. that's maybe good for us, you know? And I was like, Mm -hmm. I cannot believe that I'm reading this in black and white from a non-garbage source. So I think that us as a community, we don't come into the relationship with the right posture, with the right mindset. We're not really ready to fight through boredom, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think that's a huge deal. If you don't work through those things, you never get to the good stuff, you know? Especially if this person meets your non-negotiables, that's, there's yes. no chemistry there mm-hmm. and you've had a good run and a good relationship. Yes. So when these that's other key. things come of, I'm not happy, yeah, you have to investigate. If you've had a bad six months or a bad year, Figure out what it is that you need to step forward, move forward, and yeah. and find that passion that you've had in the past, rather than just touching the relationship. Or you're going to do this all over again. And it goes without saying, if if he talks crazy to you, if he's not nice to you, if he's not treating you well, Lord have mercy if he puts his hands on you. Whatever. I mean, there's obviously there's things that are deal breakers when they come up, but you know, particularly I, the, the you stop communicating thing just drove me nuts. To your yeah. point, if you've got a long run where you did communicate well. There was chemistry, the non-negotiables are in place. I think you hit a rough patch. You know, Ty and I have been navigating some pretty complex stuff up until this point in our relationship. You know, he's had to completely start over and rebuild a career. Yeah. Uh, we have six children together. We I feel been... like we need to have like a parade go by with a... We do. Six children, like confetti flying everywhere. And Oh my Lord. So when anybody ever bitches ever about like, it's just really hard with us right now, I just need you to say six children. When our queer couple of friends come over and they're like, we're just not happy right now. We're fighting a lot. The HOA is really pissing us off because they won't let us plant the right bushes. We're like, bitches, you better get the fuck over yourselves because I promise you you're not stressed. I promise you you're not busy. And if you're having a rough patch, go home and enjoy the silence and work that shit out. Yes. Period. We're over here with Chuck E. Cheese every night. You know what? We love each other. We care about each other. We value the relationship enough to battle through the challenges that come with all of that. And they are significant. I promise you, you can do it too. And while you're giving that little speech to your friends at the mm-hmm. dinner party, Ty can be out in the garage loading all your kids into their car. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, tell me about your problems now, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now you ain't even got time for your problems. See how no. that works? Okay, yeah. there's w- there's one other thing that I want to mention uh, about this too, and that is to watch out for reoccurring themes in relationships. Ooh, that's very good. Talk to me about that. Well, something like he was too needy and then the (laughs) next person's too needy and then the next person's too needy. There's a theme here. Everybody can't be too needy. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point it needs to be your fault. (laughs) (laughs) You know, how are we contributing to this mess? I mean, there is the idea that you choose the wrong person all the time. And that's a a real thing because of how we attach in our relationships growing up. You know, Mm -hmm. if we have dysfunctional attachments, we 
if we haven't done our work, we tend to attach ourselves to those kinds of people all yes. over again. Okay. So that's a possibility. So that's However, another reason you need to do your work because if your picker's off, you got to fix that. And this, and this is why we have community too, because if yes. you have people who are around you saying, no, that was a good person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a good person too. And yeah. that other person, he was a good person. Like we loved your old boyfriend. We loved this old boyfriend. We love yes. that old boyfriend, you yeah. know, but it's always this consistent theme of they're too needy uh, or something else, you know, or Matt, they're all 29 and a half. No. <laughs> this podcast is let's, over. let's fix is your it. picker honey <laughs> i'm sorry Ty, i had to i had to next week will be ladies and gentlemen welcome my new co-host ty wiss <laughs> i need somebody a little less bitchy on here those were issues i didn't even know i had listen when you come out at 46 years old <laughs> Issues present themselves that you didn't even know you had. You're like, what? I'm still in my 20s, right? I've got a friend who literally, he loves dudes that are exploring being gay or they're, I talk about the whole discreet thing all the time. He loves the discreet ones or like the farm boy that thinks he might like boys, but if he likes these guys that are just not really available, there's this mystique attached to them. Yeah. See, we're not looking looking for a fantasy. uh, You're looking for a fantasy. Absolutely. Well, listen, you got a friend who's really, really sweet and he likes dominant, bitchy, overbearing boys. All stuff you can recreate in the bedroom. Absolutely. (laughs) Yes. With an actual good person. Yes, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's either the picker or it's that, you know, that you keep repeating patterns. Look for patterns. Look for patterns. Uh, because that that can eat you up. And, and the thing about patterns that I find personally just annoying is when a person keeps coming back to making another person bad so that they can be yeah. good. If you don't do your work and you don't learn how to look at yourself, mm-hmm. that's what you're going to keep doing. Thinking, I'm the hero here and I just keep meeting these boys that aren't good enough for me. Seriously, how many people have you met, gay people that have gone through a breakup and you're like, how did you contribute to it? What was your part of it? And they look at you like you're crazy. They're like, he's an asshole. And you're like, whoa, you didn't learn much from that. How are we going to move that move forward different and better? You know, you talked yeah. about the breakups like, yeah, the guy was a monster and I broke free. Well, we have to be mature enough to really look at it honestly and see yeah. what we need to do differently. Well, good. I'm yeah. glad we fixed all these people. And now they can oh, go Lord. out there and find themselves, man. <laughs> our work here is done how do we want to summarize the nuggets for the children who listened and were joined us today here is our summary are you actually ready to receive are you ready to receive what does that look like get over the next best thing syndrome which is so prevalent yes. in our community yes non-negotiables there is there attraction there is there chemistry is this a person of worth for you to connect to if so focus on them and be grateful for the experience put your back into it Love it. Deal with the the inner self-saboteur. Yeah. We have to learn how to manage that. And the only way that we can do that is by talking to a therapist and understanding what that little asshole is in there trying to do and destroy, which is you. Yeah. Related to that, but still different. As you're ready to receive a relationship, a huge part of it is coming into it with the correct posture. That person's not there to serve you, to make you happy, to make you complete. That person is there for you to love on and care, for you to mutually care for each other. And when you identify a person that is a really good match, your non-negotiables in place, chemistry, all the stuff, put your back into it and don't give up when you're bored, when you hit a wall and are not communicating well, when you hit any kind of a bump, most of them can be overcome if you're both in a healthy enough place to work on the relationship when they do. I love that. I'm so glad I'm doing this with you. (laughs) And then look for patterns. Look for patterns. You have numerous relationships in the wake. And (laughs) every one of them seems to be for the same reason. They're too needy. They're too needy. They're too needy. It might be time to take a look at yourself and see what it is that you're bringing to that broken relationship. You have to be able to do a postmortem and understand your part in the breakup. Have to. You said said earlier, what am I bringing to this, to the relationship that is 
bringing this result? What's my part in the dysfunction? You get really clear on what that is. You can move forward better and different. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this different next time. I'm going to stop blocking the blessings and I'm going to enjoy this gay man. I'm going to keep him. I'm going to enjoy him. We're going to have a beautiful life. Okay, now let the music play. <laughs> oh, I am so pissed. Guess what I found out? My niece, for her birthday, her sister bought her tickets to Madonna. Is Madonna worth seeing anymore? Yes. Okay. How dare Madonna's you? 70. Honey, if she's 170, I would be there if I could get those tickets because I am a material girl and I am living in a material world. I was in love with her in seventh grade. I'm in love with her now. And my mom made me throw away all the posters I had of her because she was wearing a crucifix and panties. Yeah, she was dirty. I had invited the devil into my bedroom. When are you born? 81. 81? Yeah. <laughs> I was born in 70, so I was there when she came out. I thought it was proof that I was not gay, but I cared oh. more about those plastic bracelets and her makeup than I ever did about her boobs. Oh my. And little did you know it meant you were gay, actually. One, two, three, four. That's it for us today. For more bitchy wisdom, follow How to Find and Keep a Gay Man on Instagram and TikTok at, you guessed it, How to Find and Keep a Gay Man. And until we meet again, get a therapist, don't be an asshole, protect yourself, call your mom, and remember that you deserve a meaningful love. Bye!